So uh, let me pray and get started. Father, we take a moment to pause today, focus on you, open our hearts to what you have to say today through your word to us, Lord. We know your word is alive, is living, and uh, help us to encounter a living God in your word, that, Lord, you are alive and you are working amongst us, Lord God. So, Lord, help help us believe, help our unbelief, help us to step into the place you have for us today. In Christ's name we pray, amen and amen. amen. Let me get going. We're in chapter three of Mark. Mark, we have found, is very concise, uh, written primarily, well, to all of us, but with a, with a view toward people like the Roman people that just wanted, just tell me what to do. <laughs> just, just, <laughs> just tell me the next step, you know, that kind of thing. And uh, on Friday, we were in chapter two, and it was a great chapter, and that really it continues into chapter three. It says, and he entered again into a synagogue. So, so right off the bat here, something has been going on, and here it is again. And what, what has happened here, if we look down at the end of verse six, the, the Pharisees came to a conclusion that they were going to destroy Jesus. And that, uh, that determination, that conclusion, okay, this we've had it. We've had enough of this guy. We are going to destroy him. That came in Mark's gospel for us. Uh, in chapter 2, there were several confrontations Jesus made to the status quo. He started off healing the paralytic, but he said, I'm, I'm forgiving sins here. That was a direct confrontation to say, I'm God. And, and he hit him hard with that. Then he confronted him again, saying, I'm going to call into ministry. I'm going to call a tax gatherer, Matthew. That was a direct hit. They're like, no way. And then he sat down and he was eating with the sinners and the tax gatherers. And he just smacked them. This is the way it's going to be from now on. And they didn't like that. They, they were seething. He wouldn't fast. He was celebrating. He said there's going to be a new wineskin now. The old wineskin is going to burst. If we try to put what I'm doing into the old ways, things are going to change around here. And then he declared himself Lord of the Sabbath. And it's all right if his disciples pick some grain from the grain fields and eat them on the Sabbath. So these guys have about had it with Jesus. And this passage opens up and he entered again into the synagogue. Here he goes again. There's a new sheriff in town. He just walked in. Who's he going to blast now? <laughs> and so there were those, that group that was very much against Jesus. But then there was the rest of the people, the public, that was so excited to see this sheriff, this king, walk into town and say, what's he going to do next? They love Jesus. And so we have these two groups, and he entered again into the synagogue, and here, here's the stage. And a man was there with a withered hand. And they were watching. Everybody's watching Jesus. What's he going to do next? And they were already expecting him to bring a healing. And they were watching him to see if he would heal him on the Sabbath in order that they might accuse him. I would say it's a wonderful thing if on our Sabbath and we walk into the church that we would have this same expectation. <laughs> oh, boy, somebody's going to get healed today. <laughs> Jesus is going to heal somebody. They actually, the yeah. people that were against Jesus were expecting he was going to heal somebody. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly, we who love Jesus should expect that he's going to heal someone and our faith be alive yeah. and 
and ready for this. And, and, but they wanted him to heal someone so they could accuse him. Now, a couple of big things here. I want to um, just mention a, a woman in early Pentecost, beginning of last century. I wrote on her uh, for Zondervan, but her name is Mariah Edder Woodworth. Fantastic woman. She had huge crusades because God used her for healing. But up here in New England, in Framingham, Massachusetts, she had a healing crusade and people were getting healed and the authorities came in and arrested her for practicing medicine without a license. <laughs> they basically considered her, uh, she was pretending to be a doctor because she was healing people. And, and they put her in jail and they had a court trial, and I have the whole court proceedings. It's a fantastic story. But that's exactly what's going on here in this debate with Jesus and the Pharisees. Let me read to you the law that the Pharisees were trying to follow here in Exodus chapter 31, verse 14. This is the law that they were trying to protect the people from. Therefore, you are to observe the Sabbath, for it is holy to you. This is Exodus 31, 14. Everyone who profanes it shall surely be put to death. For whoever does any work, that's key, any work on it, that person shall be cut off from among his people. So get the intent of the Sabbath here. For six days work may be done, but on the seventh day there is a Sabbath of complete rest holy to the Lord. Whoever does any work on the Sabbath day shall surely be put to death. So the sons of Israel shall observe the Sabbath to celebrate the Sabbath throughout their generations as a perpetual covenant. It's a sign between me, God, and the sons of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, but on the seventh day he ceased from labor and was refreshed. And when he had finished speaking this, uh, speaking with him upon Mount Sinai, he gave Moses the two tablets of the testimony. This is God speaking to Moses, giving him this major uh, decalogue, the Ten Commandments, where we are to keep the Sabbath holy and we're not to do work on the Sabbath. Here was the problem that Jesus was facing. What is work on the Sabbath? What does it mean to work on the Sabbath? And Jesus is bringing a, a realignment because the Pharisees, the Mishnah, the, all the writings, the rabbis have embellished this. What does it mean to work on the Sabbath? They got to the point that you can't do anything good on the Sabbath at all. And that's not the point of the Sabbath. That's not the law. That's not the spirit of the law. So it's interesting what Jesus says here. And he said to the man with the withered hand, rise and come forward. And he said to him, he said to them, now he's speaking to these Pharisees who are misguided. They miss the heart of God. They miss the spirit of God, the, the intent of the law. He said to them, these, these people, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good? You see, the, the law is that you can't work. In other words, if you're working as a tent maker, if you're working making jewelry, if you have an occupation, you've got to stop that and rest. Give God one day um, to honor him, to worship him. And that's still intact today. And so Jesus is confronting them, says, is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath? Or to do harm? To save a life? or to kill. And where the Pharisees were ending up in their writings, in their teachings, they were saying it's okay to save a life on a Sabbath. If someone's life is in danger, we're going to say that's within the law. You see, they were just indiscriminate. They were making up what they interpreted as this law. I just read you that we are to stop our work for one day and invested in God.
But the Pharisees took it and started to add all these other things, but they made the one exception. If someone's life is in danger, you're not violating the law if you save their life. So Jesus is saying, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or do harm, to save a life or to kill? Jesus is hitting them right in the head, but they kept silent. Because really, it's a great question. Can you do something good on the Sabbath? Is doing good equal to working in your occupation? Of course not. Mm -hmm. And Jesus had them. And they kept silent. And after looking around at them, listen, with anger. Their adding on to the law actually was hurting people. It was stopping them from doing good. And this was not the heart of God. They were misguided. The heart of God is for us to do good on the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. Grieved, and that word grieved means severely grieved at the hardness of heart. They strongly missed the point of God. Jesus was bringing the new kingdom in a realignment. And he said um, to the man, stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out and his hand was restored. Now there it is. That's the vision of God. Would it be, wouldn't God love it if we all came into the church and prayed for one another and worked in the church and did good in the church? Well, you know, the, the Bible says in the law that I'm not supposed to work. I'm not supposed to do ministry. It doesn't say that. It says that, that we're not supposed to do our regular occupation on, on the day that we give to the Lord. Certainly serving the Lord, praying for people, doing good on the Sabbath is exactly in line, exactly in line with what God wants us to be doing. Mm -hmm. And Jesus was pointing this out strongly. <laughs> um and then verse six, here it comes. And the Pharisees went out and immediately began taking counsel with the Herodians against him as to how they might destroy him. Don't tell me how to be Jesus. We have already decided how we're supposed to be. And we're going to we're going to we're going to kill anything that gets in our way. The Herodians, of course, were allied with Herod. They were Jews, but they were politically correct Jews. Herodians aligning themselves politically with Herod. <sighs> so here's a problem of interpretation of the law, a problem of interpretation. And Jesus is bringing a brand new interpretation and they want to kill him for it. Verse seven, and Jesus withdrew to the sea. Always a good idea with his disciples and a great multitude from Galilee followed. So we see this is his home base and the Galileans are there, but, the, but Mark tells us more. Also from Judea, they were up from Judea and from Jerusalem and from Idumea and beyond the Jordan and the vicinity of Tyre and Sidon. A great multitude, multitude heard of all that he was doing and came. These people were desperate for God. They didn't come to the Pharisees. They came to Jesus. They wanted the real life that mm -hmm. God has to offer. They wanted to be healed, and they wanted to be set free, and they were coming from all over the place. And he told his disciples that a boat should stand ready. I love the pastor who named his boat the Word, and so if anybody asked where he was, he would say, I'm in the word. <laughs> and and Jesus, Jesus loved the water. He loved to get into these boats. And so he told his disciples that a boat should stand ready for him because of the multitude in order that they might not crowd him. For he had healed many with the result that all those who, who had afflictions pressed about him in order to touch him. And whenever the unclean spirits beheld him, they would fall down before him and cry out saying, you are the son of God. These devils, these, these devils were acting like they were worshiping him. <laughs> they, that word um, in, in, the, in the Greek there is, is not proskuneo, which to bow, to fall on your face and worship him. It's, it's another word. That just means to fall down on your face. So they prostrated themselves in that sense, fall down before him and cry out saying, you're the son of God. They're acting like they're worshiping, acting like they're honoring him. And he earnestly warned them not to make him known. Now, this is interesting because Jesus 
is working with them like, like the law enforcement would work with criminals. He doesn't kill them. He doesn't just uh, restrict them completely. They still have a life and they still have a part to play. God had created them, but they're fallen. And so he's working with them here and he earnestly warns them not to make him known. I guess he could have shut him up completely with his power, but he doesn't. That's, that's very interesting to me. And he went up to the mountain and summoned those whom he himself wanted, and they came to him. So he selected a few, and he went up to the mountain with them. Um, he was going to establish his new kingdom, his the new tribe the new leadership, and he appointed 12 that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach. So we see two qualifications. Number one, that they would be with him. Number one qualification for ministry, that you will be with Jesus, mm -hmm. that you will spend time with Jesus. And secondly, that we would be ready to go out in his name and to have authority to cast out the demons. And he appointed the 12, Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter. And then he lists all of them. And I won't go into the details here. And James, the son of Zebedee, and John, the brother of James. To them, he gave the name Boan Boanerges, which means sons of thunder. And Andrew, and Philip, and Bartholomew, and Matthew, and Thomas, and James, the son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, and Simon the Zealot. And Judas Iscariot. He chose Judas Iscariot. Could have chose anybody. He chose Judas, who also betrayed him. He picked him. And he came home, and the multitude gathered again to such an extent that they could not even eat a meal. And when his own people heard of this, they went out to take custody of him, for they were saying, he has lost his senses. And I think the view of us when we when we're overly when we're zealous for God, we're passionate for God, people actually do think we've lost our mind. Our friends actually think they've gone over the deep end. They're a religious zealot. I've been called that before by strangers when I try to share the gospel nicely to them. And they they just like, they picture me a certain way. And Jesus's family were picturing him a certain way. This guy's going off the deep end. He's just, he's just losing it here. He's so passionate for God. And I wouldn't mind that on my on the epitaph on my grave. <laughs> Crazy for God. <laughs> but that's actually what his family thought of him. So that in this passage is the first accusation against Jesus. He's lost his mind from his family. And that hurts. The second accusation is from the religious community. And here it is. Um, and the scribes who came down from Jerusalem were saying, he's possessed by Beelzebub. So the first accusation from his family is that he's lost his mind. The second accusation is from the religious community. He's, he's demon possessed. Both pretty serious, crazy allegations to, to, to lower on God, on the son of God. It's kind of a crazy thing, this world. Mm. And he casts out demons by the ruler of the demons. Now Jesus responds, and he called them to himself and began speaking to them in parables. How can Satan cast out Satan? <laughs> He's, he comes with just these beautiful teachings. And if a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. He's talking about Satan's kingdom. And I think we need to note here that if, if this were true and Satan cast out Satan, Satan would have no power. But we see in this gospel, Satan has had a lot of power. We see in this world, Satan has a lot of power. And so Jesus is saying, 
look at what you're saying. If Satan's going to cast out Satan, why would Satan's kingdom have any power? And yet here's power. They are possessing people right in front of your eyes. Your argument is wrong. And he goes on. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. But look at Satan's house is standing over here. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but he's finished. But no one can, so this is the good teaching here, but no one can enter the strong man's house and plunder his property unless he first binds the strong man and then he will plunder his house. So they're dealing in the context here of demon possessions. And, and so actually, first, Satan binds any kind of resistance in our lives and enters and plunders the house so someone can become demon possessed and he takes everything from him he takes everything from his house but now jesus is coming in and he's the strong man and jesus is binding satan and taking back what satan had stolen mm -hmm. and restoring that truly I say to you, all sins shall be forgiven, the sons of men, and whatever blasphemes they utter. And so Jesus is saying, okay, Satan may have plundered your life, but let me come and cast out Satan. I'm the greater one. I'm not on the same plane as Satan. I am certainly not demon possessed. I'm not on Satan's team. I'm here to enter in and to cast out the devils from those who Satan has plundering their life. That's what he's saying. Oh, yeah. Um, so then he says, when I come in, you'll be forgiven and whatever blasphemes they utter, but whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. So if someone consciously and wickedly rejects the, the saving power of God, the saving transformation of the Holy Spirit, the grace that God offers yeah, they're not going to be saved. They're rejecting what God is bringing. A person sets himself against forgiveness. And then he cannot expect forgiveness. Because Jesus is filled with the Holy Spirit. It's by the Holy Spirit that we have life, the Bible says. He never has, but is guilty of an eternal sin. And this is important. And, and listen to this verse 30. because. They were saying he has an unclean spirit. This is all one story. You can't take this passage out of context. This passage is about religious leaders who are responsible for bringing the gospel to the people to represent God accurately so that the people can find freedom and forgiveness in God. And it says here, because they were saying he has an unclean spirit, but the leaders are talking about God himself in saying God is a devil. And that's just not acceptable. <laughs> so this isn't about anybody who walks around saying something. This is in this particular category. They, they wouldn't accept Jesus and actually called him a devil, called him he's in league with Satan. So we have to read this in context because they were saying he has an unclean spirit. Jesus clarified um, uh, this, this uh, passage, and we can't take it out of context. And his mother and his brothers arrived and standing outside, they sent word to him and called him. And a multitude was sitting around him and they said to him, behold, your mother and your brothers are outside looking for you. And answering them, he said, who are my mothers, my mother and my brothers? And looking about on those who were sitting around him, he said, behold, my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. Joshua brought this out the other day in his devotion that we can actually be the brothers and, and sisters of Jesus Christ. And here he says it again, that it's more powerful to be in the kingdom of God and the relationship we have with Jesus and one another than even blood ties. 
then even flesh ties, those flesh ties are going to disappear. But those who are in the kingdom of God, because of the forgiveness of Christ, we will be brothers and sisters with one another and with Jesus forever. So we're part of his family. And, you know, we got to love that. Mm -hmm. um, maybe one last comment. Jesus knew that you're to honor your father and mother. The consequence for not honoring your father and mother in Exodus 21, 17 is that you're going to die if you didn't fulfill this. We have to honor our fathers and mothers. But Jesus isn't dishonoring his family. He's honoring them sufficiently. Even at the cross, we remember him honoring his mother. But he's simply stating a truth here that those who do the will of God are my brothers and sisters and mother and all the rest. They're part of my family. All right. That's all I have to say, Joshua. Oh, okay. Yeah, the, uh, the part where he talks about... Uh, about the his family rejecting him and calling him crazy. <laughs> uh, I think it's verse 21. When his own people heard of this, they went out to take custody of him. For they were saying he has lost his senses. They thought he was so crazy that they were going to try to arrest him. I think that's what that means. Or in some context, get rid of him put him away because they thought he was crazy and we can feel like that where our family sometimes rejects us because of God or calls us crazy or our friends or people that we love just reject us and call us crazy and Jesus gets us he gets us in this understands us completely his own family his own home the people he loved came to him, called him crazy, I think tried to arrest him. And he understands what that's like. And then on the contrast to that, at the very end, he says, in verse 34 and 35, Behold, my mother and my brothers, for whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. So if your family rejects you, if your <laughs> friends reject you, Jesus has a place for you in his family. He's got you. You don't need to worry about, about losing a family or about missing out on anything. You're in another family now, <laughs> it's, and it's got you, and it'll never reject you. Okay, Grandpa. Yeah, great chapter. Um, one of the things uh, that Josh and Pastor said, you know, this whole thing of family, in, in the original, it says he's crazy. You, you know, so they're very strong. And uh, the family didn't understand Jesus, obviously. James, probably who became the pastor of the church in Jerusalem after the resurrection, I don't think he, he think he's my brother. And I have, you know, three brothers, and I would never think one of them is holy. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I just, you know, I can understand a little bit as I went through. <laughs> but the thing, if we look at it from Jesus' standpoint, you can kind of catch other religious leaders, you know, their feelings, and Jesus understood that, and they were evil. But to be rejected by family members is really, really difficult and very painful. And we don't catch that in Jesus' remarks, but I'm sure he felt that way. Mm. And maybe tomorrow we'll look at some of the times in this. Jesus was misunderstood and misunderstood by his own family members. Uh, I was probably 21, 22, and I felt called, I felt called to missions before that. I'll never forget, in talking to my family, which we had uh, quite a few, maybe 40, you know, immediate family members around us. And when my dad died, my mom and my brothers, and uh, we moved into the house of my uncle, you know, for a while until mom was building a house. And I'll never forget that my uncle Bernie, he says, you know, Bob is just selfish. He wants to go overseas and try to make people Christians. And he, he just he just kind of vented this selfishness that maybe I I was doing something out of my own purposes, not for God. 
And as a young person, that really kind of hit me. You know, it didn't stop me, obviously. But I'm just saying, sometimes those closest to us, you know, James and John and Peter, obviously, they have trouble really understanding the call of God. So I'm saying, you know, maybe sometime you're going through things and maybe even a spouse or, or maybe your kids or whatever, or maybe parents do not understand what God has called you to do. Sometimes it's best just to keep silent, but other times it's to say, you know, I'm come to do the will of God. He that doeth the will of God will live forever, the scripture says. Mm-hmm. So keep that in your heart and mind. Oh, let, me, let me just do one little fun thing with you. I did this a lot with some of my students at school. I said, if I give you a word, then I want you to give me just immediately on your head, in your mind, the opposite. So if I would say light, you would say? Dark. Dark. Yeah, I can't hear you, but you probably say dark. If they say tall, you say small. Yeah. If you'd say big, you would say small. Or if you say bright, you say dark. If I say Jesus, and a lot of the students I had, they would say Satan. Now, that is really a faulty analysis. Satan is not the opposite of Jesus. He's not even close to being the opposite <laughs> of Jesus. So when we, we read this here, when Jesus is dealing and, and when they're talking about him being uh, Beelzebub and all this, you can see why. And it comes in, it, he really was torqued. When, when they begin to do this, obviously he was angry when he wanted to heal, you know, stretch forth the arm. But when it comes to here, when you ascribe to Satan the things of God, that is really dangerous. Mm-hmm. And that may be, as Pastor just said, unpardonable because you move beyond the time of grace. So you would never do that. But I'm just saying, be careful when those around you try to help them that they, they may not be followers of Christ, but they may go too far and, and ascribe to Satan the things of God, which is, that makes God upset. <laughs> so <laughs> anyway, great chapter. And we all are brothers and sisters of Christ, as we've just said. Praise God. Yeah, Amen. Good. Pray for us, Doc. Yeah. And then Josh, okay. and then I'll close this. Oh, God, we thank you. Yes. 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 Thank you today that we have Hallelujah. life. Uh, we could be wandering out in the quagmire of sin, but we live with you. I'm not saying we're perfect or that everything is easy. We know that. We're in the struggle against darkness, and we're part of you. But help us to be people of light, mm-hmm. that people will see Christ in us. Even Absolutely. before we say a word, <laughs> yes, Jesus comes through so strongly by our actions in healing people yes, and letting people know that God is our hope in the world, yes, in the kingdom, I pray. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God, for the understanding that we're part of your family now, that you will take us in, God, that you want every single one of us, and that if the world rejects us, God, you've got us in your hands. You understand yes. us, Lord. You understand our pain. You understand all we've been through, God. So I pray that today, in each day, Lord, you'd be by our side, fighting with us, God, as you said you would do, giving us strength and understanding to be a light, to be challenging and yet kind, to be nice but not too nice, God. I pray that you would be in us to do what is good in Jesus' name. Yes, Lord, you qualified those early apostles, those 12 the first qualification that they were with you. And we encounter you. We are with you in the word of God as we understand you more, as we read the word and the spirit of God reveals who you are to us, Lord God. And today, each of these that are listening, Lord God, each of these that are part of this devotion, we have been with you, Lord God, and you have been qualifying us. We're hungry for you, Lord God. We want to be with you more. And Lord, you qualify us to be part of your kingdom. 
part of those who are sent out ones to share the good news with others, empowered by the Holy Spirit, no matter what our family says or no matter what others say, Lord God, we have our marching orders, Lord God, and we have been with you and now we are going out. And so I pray you give fruit to us today. That wherever we go, we'd see it as our mission field. That you'd make us a blessing today. We pray it in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Amen. And amen. amen. Well, for those of you who are watching later, we, we're going to sign off and say goodbye to you now. Um, Lord bless you till tomorrow. Love you all. <laughs> God bless you guys. We love you.